Matthew chapter 24, verse 1, And Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one, here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us then, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Look at verse 10. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 12 said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and are linked to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Amen. I want to preach just for a little bit from this text, Matthew 24 and 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. In verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Amen. I want to preach just for a little while or teach or whatever this turns into on the curse of the last day's church. The curse of of the last day's church. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Put your Bibles down and let's pray. God, we really need your help right now. Lord, I can't do anything without you. Lord, I, I really, really, really need you to step in here right now, God. And Lord, I'm asking you, God, that you would move and help me, oh Lord, in Jesus' name. God, that that anointing and that revelation, that spirit of revelation that was here this morning would come back tonight, God. Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise for it. We thank you, Lord God. Use us tonight, God. Lord, let the anointing flow back from the people, Lord, to the pulpit. God, we'll give you the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Let's give you glory. Let's praise his name. God, we love you. Lord, we worship you. God, we magnify your name, oh Lord. We worship you tonight, God. We praise you, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. Praise his name. My God, I love you, Lord. Lord, I love you, Jesus. I give you glory, Lord. I give you honor. I give you praise, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I praise you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be seated. When I begin to seek the Lord about this, several, several weeks ago, God put this on my heart. And I began to just pray about it and seek the Lord for it. And uh, then all of a sudden it pops up on Facebook one day that uh, a good friend of ours down in Silsby, Texas had preached that to his congregation. So I know I was on the right track. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I want us to understand the Bible said that in the last days that offenses will come. Amen. It's going to be something that's going to happen. Amen. But we have to be aware, amen, of what offenses are. Uh, the definition of offense by Webster's is obsolete, an act of stumbling, or the archaic, a cause of occasion of sin, stumbling block. 
Amen. Something that outrages the moral or the physical senses or the act of attacking. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. All those things describe what happens. Amen. The spirit of offense has infiltrated the last day's church. Yes, amen. Amen. Uh, the spirit of offense causes division. It causes dissension. It causes strife. It causes hurt. It causes pain. Amen. Right. Uh, the spirit of offense is used by many. Amen. As an excuse for walking away from the church. You're walking away from God. That's the truth. Hallelujah. That's the truth. Oh, can I tell you, the Bible tells me that in the last days that there's going to come a falling away before the man of sin is revealed. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. So what we see happening in this day and hour, amen, is nothing that's not already been prophesied. Amen. And, and when I hear of, of folks turning and walking away from something they've walked in for years and years and years, and, and when I see them and I, I see the way they look and I understand, my heart breaks, amen, for many of them because I know them personally. And I understand, amen, that they've allowed some little something, amen, to offend them. They've allowed some little something. It may be a, a word the preacher said. It may be something somebody in the church said to them. But whatever it is, amen, I want you to understand tonight there is nothing in this world worth giving up truth for. Amen. There's nothing in this world, amen, that's worth going to hell for. Hallelujah. I've got my mind made up. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, Brother Carlton Watkins, my pastor, used to say, you can't offend me enough to make me quit living for God. I, I, I haven't understood this. I've tried my best to understand it, that when people get hurt, amen, they quit church and they walk away from God as if God was the one that had offended them. Oh, the spirit of the last days is, just let me have my own way. Oh, hear me. When we, when we dig into a fence a little bit more. I think you'll gain an understanding as to why this happens. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, an offense as offense infiltrates a church and destroys peace and unity. What can be done to root it out? I remember several years ago I was pastoring in Wells, Texas and I've told this story before. It's kind of kind of humorous, but at the same time, it's scary. Amen. I, I, I was sitting in my church office after or before service on a Sunday morning, and uh, my bus captain comes in. He didn't knock on my door as they usually did. He just barged right on in, and he threw the keys at me for the bus, and he said, I'm done. I'm out of here. And I'm like, what's the problem? I don't understand. And he said, you didn't speak to me. When I came in the door, I walked right past you. I said, just so happened, if you recall, you left your little 80-year-old mother sitting in the car, and it was pouring rain. I didn't see you attempt to get her out. And so I had grabbed the umbrella out of my office and was heading out there to get her when you came in running in out of the rain ah I had I was on a mission but you understand amen it wasn't just that there's other factors that caused amen him to throw keys at me and tell me he was done to this day he's not living for God to this day he's back in the world guzzling his beer and living a, a, a life of, of, of horror amen and I've got news for you that life is going to end one of these days and he's going to stand before a God and he's going to have to try to explain to God why he walked away from him because of a little offense somewhere in his life. Oh, can I tell you, it's a last day spirit. I've seen people, amen, that got offended just because, amen, that some visitor didn't shake your hand. You can't get offended at a visitor not shaking your hand. You need to shake their hand. It's your responsibility. You are the church. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I can't allow that to happen to me. Matthew 18 and 7 said, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. 
Yeah, you're going to have offenses, all right? Let me tell you something. One of the deals in the last day and hour is people get offended at the word. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the word is not going to be anything but offensive if you're living a, a life of sin. Hey, it's going to get down where you're living at. Hey, you know, what does the Word of God do? It goes down to the root of the problem. And it begins to dig it out. And that's offensive to me. And that's offensive to you. Hey, Amen. It better be offensive. Or that preacher ain't preaching it right. Hey, Amen. Oh, hear me today. But the offenses come. Hey, Amen. That we can't put up with. God said, I don't mind defending you with my Word. Because I want to dig you out. I want to make a new creature out of you. But when we get offended in the last day's church and we leave God and we walk away. But woe to that man by who the offense comes. A Greek word that is found in the scripture is descriptive of offense. Scandalon. Anybody ever heard of that? It's future tense verb form. I know you've heard of it. Scandalizo. Our word scandal and scandalize. Amen. Come from those Greek words. Oh, uh, we got to understand. Amen. That God is speaking to us. Scandalon is used by Jesus three times in Matthew 18 and 7. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Scandalon was the trigger of a trap on which bait is placed. I remember years ago, I was in Beaumont, Texas with my cousins. And there was an old man that lived on the street behind him. His name was Mr. Atkins. He was just living there by himself. He was probably close to 90 years old, but he still built little traps. He would catch those little coons that would come into town. He would hear something going on in his garbage can at night. And so he had these little box traps that he had made. And he would, in the middle of that box trap, he had put a little can, and it was attached to a string. And when that little coon or that little cat or whatever it was that was getting in his his garbage uh, would slip up into there, uh, amen, and begin to nibble on whatever he had left in that little can. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, it would find itself trapped uh, as that door fell behind it, uh, and it couldn't get out, amen. Uh, and so he would take them out and release them uh, somewhere in the woods. Uh, but this is what scandalous is, amen, uh, amen. It is a, a trigger on a trap. Uh, when the animal touches a trigger to eat the bait, the trap springs shut, uh, and the animal's in caught is caught. When used in a moral context, scandalon is defined as the enticement to conduct to conduct which will ruin the person in question. Oh, can I tell you, Satan's desire amen, is to put something within you. Amen. Oh, hear me. If it's something against one of your brethren or something against somebody in another church or something against the pastor, amen, all he's got to do is put a little thought in there, a little trick Amen. And it won't be very long before you take the bait. If you're not praying like you should. If you're not walking with God like you should. Amen. It's so easy to take the bait and to set the trap and watch him as he wins. And you walk away from God. That's right. Matthew 18, 7. Jesus' concern is the sin of being the one that causes others to sin. God's saying, you know what? Brother West, my desire is that I would never cause somebody else to sin. Amen. I, I don't want to be the one amen, that causes you to sin. But if it's the word of God I'm preaching or the word of God I'm standing on, amen, and I've got the word backing me up and it hurts your feelings, God bless you. You need to talk to him about it. He wrote it. I didn't. I'm just reading it. Amen. Do we understand tonight that God has a desire and that is for us to fall in love with him first and that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. Oh, hear me tonight. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care what your situation is. God is telling us we have to love one another. He does not stipulate whether one offends through persuasion or in your face worldliness 
are indirectly through one's matter of life. However, Matthew 5, 29 through 30 and 18, 6, 8, 9, Romans 14 and 21, that scandalizer was not used in this mean, this way, but as a cause of stumbling. In other words, it can mean a stumbling block. A number of times the Apostle Paul uses two other words, which mean basically the same thing. The first is proskoma, which means a cause of falling or stumbling block or an occasion of sinning. The second word, proskopa, means an offense or the act of offending. I do not want to be an offense to any Anybody. I don't want to be an offense to my brother. I don't want to be an offense, amen, to my name. I don't want to be an offense to somebody in the world, amen, because I'm going to stand before God one day and I'm going to give an account, amen, of how I treated folks and how I expected, amen, to treat them. Hallelujah. That's right. Amen. Now, at this point, it's easy to see that when the Bible speaks of events, it refers primarily to some act or series of acts which lead into a sin. Offenses are generally not stemming from hurt feelings, resentment, or anger that begin as minor irritations or annoyances. We can deal with that. Amen. Irritation and annoyances can build into bitterness and grudges. And that's where the danger occurs. And that's when it gets really serious. It's when that little offense, that little annoyance begins to work. Oh, come on, hear me tonight. Somebody needs to get a grasp on this. Amen. I want you to understand that Satan can't put one little thought in your mind. Oh, he's totally avoiding me. I don't know why he didn't shake my hand tonight. He went down the other aisle of the church. He wouldn't even come by where I was at. Did you make an effort to go over there to him? Well, listen to me. Amen. We, we get... Uh, some little something that the devil will put in our mind uh, and it amplifies uh, and we can't seem to get it out. Uh, we just seem to dwell on it uh, and it gets bigger uh, and bigger uh, and bigger uh, and bigger until finally uh, we're about to explode with it. Yeah. Oh Lord. Amen. Talking about the last day's problem. Come on. You know, last day's church. In that mind, you know, I believe it was Benjamin Franklin said, "Out of mind is the devil's workshop." He wasn't very far off because if you're not filling your mind, that's why the Bible tells us what to think. Amen. Amen. What's your things are pure? What's your things are holy? What's your things are good report? Think on these things. He gives a whole list of things we can think on. Amen. But you understand how the devil wants to put some little seed or something in your mind. It may not be very big. It could be like one of these little mustard seeds here. It's just a tiny thought. But he understands that if he can plant it, you'll help it grow. That's right. Amen. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. It isn't him that makes it grow. It's us that makes it grow. And the reason is because you really don't have the prayer life you need to keep it in check. That's right. Oh, Lord. Now, I understand fasting is not one of those things we like to talk about because everybody here likes to eat. You don't believe it, go look in the mirror. I can promise you, you like to eat. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Only, new, only skinny Pentecostals are the new ones. Hallelujah. Amen. But you know, pushing the plate back, what's that doing? It's crucifying what? The flesh. Oh, because the flesh is on a little schedule. Every day around 11.30 or 12 o'clock, we've got to grab something to eat. That stomach starts growling, and we, we thought, oh man, I'm, you ever hear this statement? I made it myself. Man, I'm starving. No, you're not. You've got enough to go for two or three months already built on there. Amen. But I've got news for you. If you'll take that plate and push it back, you'll crucify that flesh. You'll get control over those spirits of the flesh that want to grow that little seed that Satan puts in you. Now, offense is tied, and this is where the rubber meets the road. 
to pride and to control. You put offense and pride and control together, it's a deadly trio. Amen. It will destroy you. And the problem with it destroying you many times is it destroys others in the process. I, I, I can't afford, listen to me, you hear what I'm saying tonight? If you're guilty of being offended at somebody, you, you, you let it build and fester until you finally take it out on them and they leave the church, you're going to stand before God one day. And you're not only going to give an account for your soul, but you're going to give an account for that when you drove away from God. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. We better handle all the new folks Oh, with kid gloves, you better love your brother. You better love your sister like never before. I'm not saying anybody in this church is doing this, but I'm telling you, God gave me this as a warning to us because we're handling some folks that come here with all kinds of situations and problems and hurts in their lives already. That's right. That's right. This is a healing station. That's right. This is a hospital. Amen. It wouldn't go to the hospital. Oh, I've got this stomping. He go in the hospital, the doctor walks in and goes, slap! Yeah. What's that for? Because you're so mad. Yeah. He backhands you. What? What was that for? Because you won't go and die. Wait, what kind of doctor would that be? How long would you stay in that clinic? I'd be up after the first hit and I'd be out of there. I think that doctor done gonna whack off. But yet we can do that. That's right. Come on. With our careless words, we can mishandle things in people. And because of that, amen, we can offend. And we can be not only offended ourselves, but we can offend the offender. Amen. We can be the offender and we can offend those folks. But can I tell you tonight, God is saying, I want you to get control of your flesh. The last day's problem is pride. Amen. Pride. Offense is difficult to identify within because pride will keep us from exposing the offense in our life. Pride tells us we're always right and cannot have offense in our lives. Come on. Amen. Oh, Lord. Amen. We're just sitting there going, okay, I ain't know about me. That must be such a trouble. So he's preaching to you now. Come on. You know, we got our little spoon throwing this way. That way. Yeah. Or get that shovel out. That's, that's, oh, that's brother so and so. <laughs> See if I can hit brother Wally on the back row with that You need to own it. Now, Proverbs 13 and 10 said, Only by pride cometh contention. So, church problems, church situations come from pride. That's what the word said. Only by pride cometh contention. You know what it is? Somebody gets a little attitude of... Bless God, he ain't talking about me. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah. But then it said, but with the well advised is wisdom. When people are offended, the offense is usually rooted in pride. The Bible said pride goes before a fall. Yeah, However, with offense, people don't see the fall as a result of their own doing. But they want to put the blame on somebody else. Yeah. Hello? Amen. Some people cannot handle the thought of being wrong. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the problem. That's right. You've got to understand you can be wrong. I can be wrong. I can make mistakes. That's right. Oh, but 
but pride keeps us from admitting, amen, that we've made a mistake. Pride keeps us from going to that brother or sister and saying, would you forgive me? I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend you. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Now, if you expect me to preach off of this pulpit, I will not apologize, amen, for the word of God. Hear me, because that's the word. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you the word, and I won't apologize for it. But can I tell you, if a spirit of pride takes over me, and I become so prideful in the pulpit that I can't even look at you, and I can walk by you with my head in the air, something's wrong with that picture. Amen. And God will bring me down. But can I tell you tonight, the reason I'm preaching what I'm preaching is because I love you, and I want you to make it to heaven. I don't want anybody lost. You understand, we're dealing with a lot of devils. We were just talking about that a while ago. Brother Andrew was talking about how the devils, oh, we got them started up there mad. Yeah, they they're everywhere. Hey, Amen. they're hitting everybody. Hey, Amen. they're even bouncing off in Colorado. The Colorado uh, City over there. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Brother, last weekend, brother, O'Quinn gets into a nest of bees and has his head swollen up the size of a pumpkin. And this weekend, his wife's got the flu. Amen. So let me tell you something. We got them stirred up in the entire area. It's not just in Abilene. Amen. We've been coming against the demons that control this entire area. Oh, somebody here tonight needs to understand. You cannot allow your stinking flesh to get in the way of a move of God. Some folks just can't handle those dogs and I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. You know, you, know, you ever see people like, those kind of people drive me crazy. They're always right. Yeah. Ain't nobody wrong but them. But you, I mean, they're not wrong. They're always right. Oh, you Come ever on. see those kind? Hey, Amen. Those kind of folks drive me bananas. Hey, Amen. I, I would like for at least one time, because you can tell them something. And they said, no, that's not the way it is. This is the way it is. Well, hello, who made you the executive decision maker on that? Yeah. Hallelujah. Actually, I've got book learning. I know what I'm talking about. Amen. And you're just looking at me and thinking that you know it all. Come on, hear me. Amen. Some people can't handle the thought of being wrong. And then they feel shameful and unworthy. Amen. When the Spirit of God begins to move and reveal it. Amen. You know, if you pray, God takes care of things. He reveals us to ourselves. Hmm. When a person offers direction or correction to a prideful, offensive person, often it's interpreted as, I just can't do anything right. You ever see that? Or then the other one, oh Lord, I messed up again. All I ever do is mess up. Then they're going to have a pity party right before they leave the church. Yeah. Poor, poor, pitiful me. It's pride. That's right. Proverbs tells me, 16 and 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's right. <clears throat> yeah, amen. We need, the Bible said we need to come humbly before the throne of grace. Hallelujah. We need to recognize who we ain't. Amen. We don't need to know who we are. We need to know who we ain't as we stand in his presence. Lord, I am nothing. Amen. I tell God many times when I'm praying, God, I'm nothing but a glorified mud ball. I don't deserve any blessings you've given me. I don't deserve to be in your ministry. I don't deserve anything you've done in my life. But God, I'm so grateful for the privilege I have to serve you because it's not about me. Nowhere in the world has this ever been about me or will it ever be about me. This is about you. You reached down and you filled me with the Holy Ghost and you gave me joy and you gave me peace and you brought me out and you filled me all the overflowing with your spirit. I don't deserve, I don't deserve to be here tonight. First Corinthians 13, 
Paul tells the Corinthian church, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love. It's interpreted as love. I'm becoming as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, just a bunch of noise. I don't want to be just a bunch of noise in this church. I don't want to be just a noise maker. But I want this to be real. If it's not real, then I need to go somewhere and find a place of repentance and start all over again until it becomes real to me. Oh, but let me tell somebody here tonight, amen, you need to lock in with him. This needs to be the central theme of your world. And though I have a gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains. I have not charity, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned, have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Everybody say kind. Charity envieth not. Oh Lord. My brother so and so got a new one. I'm going to have to help with that. Come on. Mm -hmm. I've been lusting after Brother Ian, Brother Wiley's AR-15 for a while now. He ain't give it to me yet, so I'm going to have to go get one one of these days. Not just messing around with y'all. Amen. He said, <laughs> Charity suffer long, and it's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity boneth not itself. It's not puffed up. Did not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Yeah. Let me read that in the Amplified. If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as is inspired by God's love for us and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose and understand all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge, if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. You see, he makes a difference. Even if I dole, dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned or in order that I make glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious, never boils over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. Look at verse 5. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. Right. It is not rude or unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Wow. So the love of God in you should rejoice. The Bible tells me that, that all of heaven rejoices when a, when just when a sinner repents. That's right, man. Hallelujah. They're having a victory march. The angels are shouting and dancing around the throne and up and down the streets of gold. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, all of heaven is rejoicing just because some, can't, some guys in the altar repenting. Amen. So if heaven responds like that, amen, how should the Spirit of God in you respond when you stand in His presence? Ooh, hallelujah. Ah, that's why we get excited like we do. Amen. That's what makes us jump. That's what makes us dance. That's what makes us run the aisles. Amen. Oh, hear me. That's what makes us rejoice. I've seen them run the back of the pews. I've seen them run down the rail that you couldn't even hardly stand on. I've seen them jump over the pulpit. I've seen all kind of crazy stuff. But I'm here to tell somebody tonight that when the power and spirit of God 
is on you. Amen. You become emotional like never before. Hallelujah. It does rejoice when Ryan and Truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. Is ever ready to believe the best. Listen to this. Is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Can I tell you one of the problems we're facing nowadays is the church yeah. is too judgmental That's right. of the world. That's right. That's right. It ain't your responsibility to figure out amen, when they come walking in our doors. They may be high when they come in. They may be drunk to skunk when they come in. But I've watched God sober them up as they hit the altar. I've seen them. They couldn't even walk in the door. They were so drunk. And sat on the back pew in the church I pastored in Wales, Texas. But I've watched them as they come toward the front to pray. And by the time they got to the front, they were totally sober. Oh, you hear me tonight? We're quick to judge. But that's not your responsibility. That's not your place. You're out of place. Amen. When you judge, you just need to say, God, I thank you for this soul that you're bringing to us. I don't know what his problem is. I don't know his background. I don't need to know his background. All I know is that he's a sinner in need of you. And the word is going to be preached. And hopefully it'll prick his heart. And hopefully he'll go to the altar. That's right. You know, many of us that are quick to point suffer from that same problem back years ago before God filled us. Holy. Amen. So you got to understand, love's hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. <clears throat> Hallelujah. First Corinthians, verse thir chapter thirteen, verse five. Let's read verse five in in the Living Bible. Never haughty or selfish or rude. I'm talking about love. We're talking about the love of God in you. It's never haughty. It's never selfish. It's never rude. Amen. Love does not demand its own way. It's not irritable or touchy. Hmm. Oh. It does not hold grudges. And I like this part. And will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. Ooh. Oh. oh my God. I remember years ago hearing about uh, an elderly woman. Hey, Amen. She didn't even have the truth. She was in another denomination. But I'm, I, I, the, the story is, uh, hey, Amen, that her her uh, her mother or her her, her daughter-in-law, I, mean, I believe it was, uh, was so mean and so nasty. And she would write the horriblest letters uh, and she would mail them to this woman. Uh, and this woman, uh, I heard from her son, he said, I watched my mom. And she would get that letter and she wouldn't even open it. She would see who it's from and she would just laugh and walk over and dump it in the trash and just continue on her way in her happy, gleeful self. Can I tell you, that's what God wants us to do. Amen. When people come against us, when the enemy rises up against your soul, God wants you to keep going forward. He doesn't want you to backtrack. He doesn't want you to get all angry and say, I'm going to get them. I'm going to do everything I can within my power to bring them down. No! God wants you just to keep pushing forward and keep loving them and keep loving Him and He'll take care of the business that needs to be taken care of. Hallelujah. Now, I'm about done. 1 Corinthians 13 and 5 does not deny the fact that offenses will come. Just as Jesus said, they range from hurt feelings, giving rise to a mild animosity, to direct powerful temptations to sin through a flaming temper bent on getting even. Yet we can overcome all of them because love is not provoked or exasperated. The love of God shed abroad where? In our hearts. 
how by the Holy Ghost. If you have the love of God, there won't be any animosity in you. Just saying. Just saying. If you've got the Spirit of God in you, Brother Carlton Watkins, my pastor, before we moved out here, he said, you know, told us, of course, I've always been one to tip good in restaurants. I just like to take care of them because they work so hard for their money and they don't get paid much. My wife used to be a waitress before we got married, so I know they, they just basically live off the of tips. So I always try to tip good. But, but Brother Watkins said, you know, you, you go into the restaurant and that waiter or that waitress is so ugly. They come to your table slamming and banging stuff around. We had one happen just a few days ago, actually. They got a couple of Sundays back. We had one come in and, oh, rude, 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 rude. But you know what we did? We didn't get all bent out of shape. Well, we didn't tell them, we're going to give you a tip. You know what we did? We just got in there with them. We just complimented them. We just loved them. And he said, you know, you never know what they just went through with the last customer. Amen. We were sitting in a restaurant here in town. My wife and I were one night. And, and, and there was a huge table full of people. There must have been 10 or 15 folks around that table. And, and that girl was working so hard. They were working her to death. And, and they were as rude as they could be to her. And at the end of the meal, I, I, I overheard her. She wasn't meaning it for me to overhear. She was uh, cleaning up the table. And one of the guys came by, one of the other waiters. And he said, they didn't leave you a tip. And she said, no. There's no tip. He said, did you check the register? She said, yeah. They didn't leave one on the register. And, and, and I know for a fact, amen, that that girl, we had watched her. And she was working her heart out for those folks. And being as pleasant as she could be, I just reached in my pocket and I pulled out a bill. Amen. And I handed it to her. And I said, look, ma'am, I want to pay your tip. I noticed those folks didn't leave you one. But I'm going to give you a good tip because you took very good care of them. And tears filled her eyes. Let me tell somebody here tonight. I mean, you can make a difference. God has put you in this world to be different from the world. Amen. You've been filled with His Spirit. You've been brought out of a world that hates everything and everybody. Oh, hear me today. But there's a danger in the last day's church and that is allowing our flesh to dominate. And that is allowing our flesh to take control. We don't have that as an option. Because the moment flesh begins to take control, the Spirit of God departs from you. God just backs up and says, okay. You want to act like a bull in a china closet, I'll stand here and watch. But I ain't going to be no part of it. And he just steps aside. And watch his folks destroy their own selves. You're not destroying that person. You're destroying yourself. Give me a stand. I don't know of anybody in this church that I'm even preaching this to tonight. All I know is two weeks or three weeks ago now, the Lord began to put this into my spirit. Because, you know, we can make it. We've got to make it. I don't want anybody to be lost. I've watched them walk away. I've watched them go back into the world. I've watched them do things they never have done before. It's all over some little offense that they didn't take care of, that they allowed to grow because that offense became so big in their world, it became bigger than the God they serve.
flesh. Flesh can be destroyed. But spirit can be destroyed quicker. We've got to be careful. Do not be offended. And do not be an offender. You hear me? We've got to be careful not to be offended, but we've got to be more careful not to be an offender. That's right. That's good. You don't need any blood on your hands when you stand before God. No. And we just lift our hands right now. Let's just talk to Him, God.